irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to Question Reality with Priscilla Leona, right here on LA Talk Radio. Hey, welcome to Question Reality. My name is Priscilla Leona, and we are coming to you live from Los Angeles, California. For nine years, we have been ranked the number one entertainment career advice radio show worldwide. And this show is for you if you are questioning your career reality by considering or currently pursuing a career in the entertainment industry. Now, the guests on this show provide you with tips, advice, and resource information on how and what it takes to per- to successfully pursue a career in a wide variety of showbiz jobs. Now, the guests on this show include Emmy winners, graduate Emmy winners, Tony Award winners, reality TV stars, producers, directors, casting directors, talent managers, agents, screenwriters, actors. Ah, woo, ah, whew, ah, oh, I need to be in better shape just to get through this paragraph. Uh, comedians, novelists, script supervisors, basically the list goes on and on. What's special about this show is that all of our guests have been selected because they are at different stages of their careers from celebrity status obviously to professional and then once in a while we will bring on the novice or the beginner so that means that we will definitely have someone on this show who will be able to answer your show business career questions doesn't matter someone's gonna be on now if you missed any of our shows or you want to seek advice about a specific entertainment career go to our archive page on the latalkradio.com website and search for our show title question reality or search by my name priscilla leona and you can download and listen to any of the interviews 24 hours a day now all of the question reality shows are also available for free on itunes google play and stitcher.com under the podcast section so please go there so you can listen to me 24 hours a day 365 days a year wouldn't you love to wake up to this voice yes okay (laughs) all right all right maybe not okay so uh also make sure you get our newly designed free app on the home page of the la talk radio website it's located towards the bottom i get so many emails where is that i can't find it it's on the right scroll scroll down and it's right there Finally, if you want to be a guest or refer someone to be on this show to promote yourself, the products, help our listeners with your sage career advice, we are currently booked for the rest of the year, but we're booking for the new year, January, February, and March. So go to our official website, which is questionrealityradioshow.com and click the contact link and submit for interview consideration. And um, we're, oh, we have a waiting list. Again, we're booked six months or a year in advance, but please, please submit anyway, because we can always book you a spot. And then if you have something come up like a tour or a film or whatever the appointment may be, we can always reschedule you, but it's just important to get on the book. So there you go. Now, we have a, oh my gosh, when I saw this man, the guest today, I was at the Sai Suman Celebrity Fashion Show in April, and I saw him across the room, and I said, it, it sounded, I hear, now, I know you may think I'm weird, but when I see people, I literally, it might be a mental deficiency, I see Oh, and hear things like I saw wind blowing through his hair. And then I saw, I heard like, da, 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 da. I don't know what it was. Albert thinks I'm very strange. Uh, but I saw him and I'm like, oh my God, who is he? And then someone said, it's so weird that you found this man because that is John Blythe Barrymore the third. Yes. Yes. That is who we saw. He is a producer and a I love to say this word 
finally I get to use it. Um, it was one of those spelling bee sixth grade words I learned. I never got to use it until I met John Blythe Barrymore III. He is a scion to the Barrymore Empire. Another applause, can we, Albert? I think we give him another applause. We don't have many scions on the show. Now, if you're not familiar with John, with um, uh, who John is, he is a film and television actor. He was born to John Drew Barrymore and Cara Williams. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And as such, he is from the famous entertainment industry Barrymore family. He is the half-brother of actress Drew Barrymore, as well as the grandnephew of Ethel Barrymore and Lionel Barrymore. And what I found so cute was that his first role on television, he was Zeke in the 1970s television series Kung Fu. Oh, that was one of that, my that favorite was shows. My, uh, that was, was that actually your... my... It wasn't my first role. My first role, I was... See, four... that, you need to change your IMDb. Mm. My I... first role, I was four months old. Oh. Oh. <laughs> uh, it was live TV. Oh. Hallmark, four... Hallmark uh, Theater. Went out live. There was no videotape. Uh... Went out once, and they managed to make money on it because there was only three networks. My father was playing Moses, and I played baby Moses in the basket. I'll be damned. Oh, my God. Well, I stand corrected. That damn IMDb is always giving me the wrong information. Um, we also have the hot, sexy Eric Erickson as the co-host. Aww. Yes. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Uh, our Eric is on, oh, among so many things. He's so multi hyphenated. Uh, he is an actor, a producer, a screenwriter, and he is here to tell us about his new feature film, Truth, which, if I'm correct, he just started shooting, I believe, on September 12th. I could be wrong, but hopefully we that is. I am right. Can. can I remember? Can you say You're in already done. Yeah. Yeah, we are in the can. Oh, yeah, that definitely bring that closer to John because we can't hear John. What's happening? Uh, no. Oh, she said we that. can't hear you. Oh, that's oh, better. I, is that better? Yeah, you remember how you were on that show Lick last week? Well, get up there like you're ready to lick <laughs> uh, that microphone. Yes. All right. Yes. So so listen, um, real quick, uh, Eric's website is theangryviking.com, valhallaprods.com, and the I feel like saying the Klondike Brothers, but I know it's the Kondalik Brothers. The Kondalik Kondalik Brothers. Brothers. .com, so check that out. Um, also, <laughs> real quick, I just want to thank Jill Estevez, uh, professional actor, brother Martin Sheen, uncle of Emilio Estevez and Charlie Sheen. He came on the show a couple weeks ago, and we are so excited. He is going to be starring opposite William Shatner and Christopher Lloyd in the romantic comedy Senior Moment. It's coming out maybe possibly in January, not sure. But Joe, this is for you. We love you. We hope Hi, you Joe. come. Hi, Joe. Oh, I think. I, know Joe. I think. Oh, okay. I, I uh, apparently. Why do we have the gong? Because that was the for Joe. Oh, for Joe. Oh, we get a gong. Joe gets a gong. Okay, Joe Estevez. Uh, if you want to check the movie out, it's um, SeniorMomentMovie.com. Um, so we're going to have Joe back on the show. And I wanted to thank the very esteemed and elite guest casting action community committee members, uh, panelists. They were recently on the show. They are some of the top A-list casting directors in this business, uh, which included Gary Zuckerbrod, uh, Alan Hooper. He's currently casting Modern Family. He just got, uh, I think they just renewed him for two more years. Yes, two more years. So yay, Alan. Um, uh, Asia Ray Coleman, actress, author, and David H. Lawrence, the 17th. We got John, who's a third. Well, David's a 17th. My God. Uh, he's an actor, voiceover, artist, teacher, and he created an app for actors that actually help you to memorize your lines. So you might want to check the app store for that. Jason Kennedy, my lovely little Jason Kennedy. He is the casting director for NCIS. Oh, you know what? God bless him. He, I'm atheist. I don't know why I say that, but I just say it. <laughs> what it was. And, oh, it's like you say like, like, like. He was on the show and then um a couple of days later he actually called me and said priscilla i i have a a project that i think you might be perfect for and so i went in and auditioned for ncis and um 
<laughs> that was a total disaster. I complete. I mean, me of all people, you know how anal retentive I am. I've been on the show nine years. You know that I tell everyone. When you are an actor and you are going out for a role, you when you get the sides, you always, 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 always read through all the parts that are X'd out. You go through the whole entire thing. Do I not know this, people? You know I know this. Well, what do I do? I go on the audition. I I forget to read a whole line. I, 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 it, I printed it out. I don't know what happened to it. And I read one and they're looking at me like, okay, well, uh, where's the rest? So I look like a total nut. I was like, oh, Jason, I'm so sorry. But he was cool. He's like, ah, it's okay. Okay, so um, you might want to go and Google uh, the community action committee casting members because they are they would love for you to support the casting director workshops as you know um i don't want to get political i'm not political but you know they're shutting down casting director workshops right and left and they are actually arresting a lot of casting directors so this particular community casting committee is helping by having funding for their lawyers and et cetera et cetera to help them because it's really getting crazy and casting director workshops are very very important legitimate ones are very 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 important for actors uh so google them okay lastly we are going to go on now i have gotten tons of emails I I know I forgot to tell you what the first week in October you know I always tell you what my Halloween love is and you know Halloween and Christmas are our absolute favorite holidays and I am going to tell you what my eight rules are but I'm going to break it down into like three and and every week I'm going to tell you three more till we get to eight because I just can't go through the whole eight Okay, I cannot do it. So first I want to start out with, really quick, um, Eric and John, how do you guys feel about Halloween? Like, do you participate in Halloween? I love Halloween. You do? Because, uh, you know, the the most prudish women, it's like, what kind of slut can I dress as this year? (laughs) (laughs) What? Do you dress like a a, a hooker? Like, for real? No, no, all the women in Hollywood. all, All the ones who, like, who usually are the most prim and... If Halloween is their is their night to like. What but kind of slut good. can I be this year? You, know? you would look good in a sexy made out. <laughs> uh, you know, have and the legs for it and have. <laughs> yes, okay. I bet. In and the back about, of that closet. And what about you, Eric? What's your favorite cost if you dress up? I, Obviously, I a Viking. Mm, oh, you I, would be a perfect Viking. Last year, I went as a nerd. I went as I, I, I showed up. Hello, everybody. It's nice to be here. And I just kind of showed up like that with the glasses Ooh, and the whole thing. Okay. So, I can you know, see that. The Viking thing's a little offensive to me. Because, oh, it is. Yeah, because it's actually German. For, and and for, yes, German. they never wore. Oh. Like, Wagner put. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Wagner put Vikings in horned helmets. They never actually wore horned helmets. Really? Yeah, see, I got a backer right see, here. <laughs> we didn't even know. You're giving us like sage wisdom over here, John Blythe Barrymore. I'm gonna say that. I gotta bring you to a party and like back me up because no one believes it. (laughs) So number one, decorations. Halloween decorations are absolutely fabulous. Um, They're not too sentimental. You know, they're not overly expensive. You don't need wires like you do at Christmas. So, um, but yet you get to appreciate when somebody has a party and their teamwork and the effort. So decorations is my number one thing. Halloween music. Oh my god. It is so fun. Monster Mash, the Ghostbuster theme. By the way, I just did a duet with Ray Parker Jr. You can go on YouTube and see it. I think I did a good job. Um, and we, let's see, the Adams, the Adams Family theme song, the Twilight Zone, Michael Jackson Thriller, Rockwell's Always Feel Like Somebody's Watching Me. What's your favorite Halloween song, John Blythe Barrymore? Um... <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't. I can't believe he's speechless. This is the uh, first time you. Have what's that? Not what's been... that one that was always playing after people jumped out the window? Gloomy, gloomy Monday. Gloomy, mo- stormy Monday. Uh, no, it was a after the, the, people jumped out. Yeah, the it was window. like 1929, and and, oh. and and often after they le- le- leapt out the window, this song would be playing on. There was. I like, didn't. I never knew about <laughs> that. We got, Dan. We got to look that up. <laughs> Dan, get closer. The microphone's over here, sweetie. Bring it on over. What's oh, your favorite song? I I I'm gonna go with the Monster Mash. Monster, like you Monster said. Mash. Yeah, that's a classic. You know, um, yeah, that's my after favorite. the baby Moses thing. Uh, Norman a- <laughs> After your four month yeah. debut, yeah. Norman Abbott, who was a great guy. Oh no, it's next! I, oh, don't tell him yet. I already got that. 
that. I got that <laughs> down. I'm not You're leaving that Very good. Out. Okay. Oh, now, now, oh that I have to was say, like I have my to jump favorite in. thing. I have to you. jump in because because we're doing radio. Yeah. If you could see your eyes right now. <laughs> like, oh, like look at this. <laughs> She doesn't need a costume. <laughs> oh, but I get so excited about Christmas and Halloween because I get to dress up like a big egg. I have to dress appropriately so I can be like the yolk in a big egg. And I've had to come up with like things that fit my portly figure. So I come up with the idea to be an egg and then a, like an alarm clock. And now I'm like taking requests at this point. But um, I just love Halloween music. Halloween song, Dan, real quick. Um, That's Dan Krause. Zombie Steve Jobs. That's not a song. No, I'm sorry. I thought we were still talking about costumes. Yes, we <laughs> most certainly are. You know what? I'm going to write a song called Zombie Steve Jobs, and then that will be my answer. Okay, that'll be. We'll All come right. back to that. Now, movies. Halloween movies are the best, and we got slasher movies, traditional classics, and adults love it. They love the movies, and adults and children alike can enjoy watching the scary movies. Now. I love Halloween, which the franchise, I like all of it, but my favorite's Hocus Pocus. I know what you did last summer. What's your favorite Halloween movie? I gotta go with the classic zombie films. Dawn okay. of the Dead, Day of the yeah. Dead. You know what? What's I've, your favorite? I've been in show business my entire life. My family's been in it for 200 years. Take it from me. <laughs> Zombies are dead. Oh. <laughs> yes! You're killing me. Tom. It's all about shapeshifters <laughs> yes! now. Yes! Shapeshifters. And candy. <laughs> Last one. Candy, candy, candy. Halloween celebrates gluttony. I participate in one of the seven <laughs> sins being gluttonous. Uh, I can eat as much candy as my stomach can fit. And Lord knows you know I have a love of the fork and spoon. So I can fit a lot of damn candy up in here. So um, I love it because of the candy. Who doesn't like to be given permission to eat? Favorite candy when you were a kid, John Blythe Barrymore? Uh, with Snickers. And uh, I and when I when my kids were small and I raided their bags, it was I, I the Snickers were the first yes. things I stole. You stole and candy from your kids. Oh yes, yes I just have to did. make sure there's no razor blades in here. Yeah, oh. that's a good excuse. <laughs> right. And everybody had a worse nice. candy. Like mine was candy corn. Oh. I hated. You candy You know what? Corn. I grew up during the Cold War, and they fed us wax and told us it was candy, and we ate it. Okay? <laughs> and you like? Shut up! Eat oh your my wax. God. <laughs> Eat your damn wax. <laughs> and you had a hole in your shoe, and you no, had no, we to had, dry it like little, four miles uh, to school. The, the Helms guy would have these in his truck. Uh, the Decolas. It was a little wax Coke bottle with like oh, two dro- no. drops of uh, And then there, of course, were wax lips, which made no yes. pretense to flavor yeah. of any kind. Uh, Wait, yeah. I'd chew them and eat them. Hey, like we had to keep the oil industry afloat, okay? Yes. You know. <laughs> All right. Uh, wor- what, best and worst candy on Halloween. The worst Eric is Erickson. candy corn. I love candy corn. Candy corn. Oh, hey, candy corn. I love candy corn, even though it's mostly wax. <laughs> People are going to start sending it to you. They're going to give you... It's carnuba wax. That oh. is it. Okay, costumes. Obviously, imagination brings costume. You can go with the classic. But I have seen recently people have really come up with imagination, imaginative costumes. Favorite costume you've seen, you don't have to have worn it, well, uh, and worst costume, okay, John Blake um, Barrymore. It's a toss-up because the, that year of the, the, the killer umbrellas, when Christo had those umbrellas, the, that, that year on Santa Monica Boulevard, there were incredible killer umbrella costumes. But last year, uh, two years ago, I was at a party, and seven guys showed up all dressed as Waldo. <laughs> Quite easy to find him. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I think I think that's and the worst costume is probably um, the one I usually wear, which is I put on a suit, and for me that's a costume. Yes, <laughs> ah, Eric Erickson, best and worst. Um, my that worst you've costume seen, that you've is seen. You don't have to warn him. John John in the in the sexy maid costume. <gasps> that would be my worst uh, costume. I have a picture of me in a feathered uh, boa and nothing else. Uh, I think I just found my best costume. (laughs) Now, also, uh, six activities. Farmers finally get to sell their pumpkins. And who doesn't love to carve? Pumpkins. Uh, Pumpkin carving, setting up bonfires. They're just fantastic bonding experience. Love to do them on Halloween. What is your favorite thing to do as an adult uh, well, on Halloween, and you, you know. I always had uh, when I had my house up in Pacific Grove. I had worked at Rhino Records. The first database I wrote was for them, and uh, 
they had a, they gave me all the product I wanted, and they had some a bunch of Halloween records, and so I would just be blasting the and, the, and I think it it deterred a certain number of people from even <laughs> <laughs> approaching my door. But it was you know it, let, let's set the mood, okay? Yeah. Okay, and what is yours, Eric Erickson? My what was the question? Oh, uh, what is your favorite thing to do on Hall- Halloween, and why? I I. I don't really do the Halloween thing, so I oh, honestly okay. can't answer that. Oh, well, my I favorite mean, thing to do is, to, you know, sex, of course. Of yeah, course! I mean, with the in sexy your, maid costume. No, 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 with, with, the, the, with the girl in the in the Catholic school girl oh, costume. Oh, because, oh, because that has men. always been a sex costume. Oh, okay. my face Lord. It. <laughs> I, I will come back with that. I think one of the funnest things to do is to see all the different women who, who dress conservatively the entire year long, yeah. and then yeah. that one night they're like, yeah. I'm a slut. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Dan Krauss. Bad movie night. Any... Uh, Oh, oh any, that's any right. Oh, well, yeah. hey. Yeah. You know what? One time a friend called me. It was The film was Trick or Treats, okay, a long time ago. Oh, okay. And he said, I had just turned to my wife and said, this is the worst movie I've ever seen. And then you came on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, so we will continue with the rest of the Halloween uh, questions with our guests next By the way, I, I, I have a shitload of... Uh, I, I never did... Hor- the, Trick or Treats was the exception. I never really did horror movies. In the last year, don't you start because I'm about to list some ho- the movies I, you've been in. So you better it, stop. Recently, uh, the, yes, I've been doing nothing I, but horror. Yes, movies. you are. Now, um, that is exactly when I. Well, I got so many things to talk to you about. But speaking of Halloween and spooky shows, you were saying earlier, Norman Abbott, the director of the television show The Monsters, one of my faves, the creator uh, of the, the creator show, show uh, wanted you to play the role of Eddie Munster on that show. But your mom did not allow you to take that role. And in later years, I understand that you thanked your mother for not allowing you to become a child actor. So I would think as a child, I would be obsessed with doing that role. Why did you? Well, first of all, first of all, I grew up in the middle of show business. When I was six years old, I knew Rock Hudson was gay and I knew what that meant. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So uh, movie stars never impressed me. Yeah. Uh, But I wanted to do it for the money. Of course. Yeah. Uh, and to get to wear the cool makeup. That's what no, I was No, I didn't get no, I didn't get But but Norman was a great guy and he was sort of a like a, you know, a father figure. He was he was hey, I'm a Jew. I survived placing limpet mines on Nazi submarine nets. The rest is gravy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh but um I did thank her because by that time I'd gotten to know my little sister when she was a child actor. Oh, yeah. And uh when, you, plus, when you're a kid Drew, on a, a series, yeah. yeah. When you're a kid on a series, you're not even an actor. You're a kid on a series. Will Wheaton discovered this when he mm-hmm. when the Star Trek TNG ended, and he had to reinvent himself as a writer. Right. And so uh, I thanked her. I said, "Listen, you know, uh, we've not exactly been like peanut butter and jelly, but I want to thank you for that." And she also the other thing she got me to do was she got me to take Danny Simon's comedy writing class. Mm-hmm. I wasn't a writer at the time. I am now. And every other person in that class was a professional television comedy writer. And boy, am I glad I did. As for the rest of it, well, she said to me recently, because she's still going strong at 92, I wish I never had any children. Your mom. It didn't take me a second to come back with, I can understand that. You weren't very good at it. And we both had a big laugh because she's very smart and has a great sense of humor, but neither of us was joking at all. We both knew that, too. That's why it was funny. Little do people know that your mom was actually nominated for an Academy Award. That's right. Uh, um, the defined ones. The yes, defined ones. Defined. Uh, Donald Trump is a narcissistic personality who is a moron and an idiot and a you know bozo. My mother is a narcissistic personality who is extremely smart and a world class actress, an Academy Award nominated. Actress. So she would make a better president. She said to me, "You always hated me," and I said, "No, I'm not. I'm grateful you were my mother." She said, "Really?" I said, "Yeah. A rough sea makes a good sailor." <laughs> Wow. Oh, my Lord. (laughs) Family dinners at your house just must be a joy. Oh, nice. Now, looking at your long list of film and television projects on IMDb, uh, it seems like you're really, it seemed like, until you just said that, you were a big (laughs) horror slash type actor and as a matter of fact I see that you're in a couple films in post-production right now one called Tales of Frankenstein and Bond of Justice 
Kazuna. So can you tell us a little bit about those movies okay, well, and um, what are your favorite types uh, of films? Okay, well, uh, I'm, I mean, re- just released was Hitchhiker Massacre. Okay. Yeah. Spoiler alert, I'm the massacre <laughs> Okay, and uh, c- coming out uh, on Halloween is uh, Dances with Werewolves. I saw that. <laughs> I thought that was hysterical. Is that a comedy? It's got to be a comedy. You know, it's it's got to be. It's it, Well, the original title was She-Wolves, and the thing is, even though the female werewolf costume still looked a little cheesy, I was blown away by how much better the movie was than I expected or than its budget <laughs> justified. <laughs> and it was the quality of the acting. You got great actors in there. And Dan Golden. And uh, I have one scene. It's one of the last scenes shot on the Sixth Street Bridge before they demoed it. Wow. Um, and then uh, Tells Frankenstein, there is four stories. I'm the lead in story two. And Bond Kazuna, that's, already, that's a, a Japanese series. And I think that's already been exhibited. Uh, or it's in, I'm, I'm not sure, because, you know, everybody spoke Japanese except <laughs> me. Uh, um, uh, and oh, fake news! That's the that's one. That's what I wanted to talk about. Yeah. Fake oh. news. It's in post production. So what I, the I, hell is that about? It's it's about. I, I play the editor of the paper, being forced into retirement. Okay. Um, it's about. It's a murder story, really, and it's a uh, it's political murder thriller. And Eric Roberts is in it. <gasps> Oh, yeah. Speaking of other guys who got nothing but dumped on by their movie star sisters oh. for thirty years, okay. <laughs> Eric works a lot, though. He I know he does. I know he does. And uh, you know, uh, but you know what? I knew Eric. We used to hang out thirty years ago at Tonis. Nobody recognizes me without my red hair. And when I came back to LA in two thousand nine, I disappeared into technology for twenty years. I was running software. When I came back in two thousand nine, I was not trying to resurrect my acting career. But people have thrown all these jobs at me because I'm much more castable than when I was a skinny redheaded kid. Mm. I realized I should have been dyeing my hair back yes. then. I would have got a lot more yes. work. Yeah. Now, so, Eric, did you want to? Well, ask I wanted to ask something. You you had said earlier that you didn't do a lot of horror, but now you're starting to. It's it. just if recent. I because that's what people are making. Because first of all, uh, Hitchhiker Massacre was not the first film I made that was shot in six days. Okay, <laughs> I did four of them for Fred Olin Ray that were all shot in six days. Uh, but it was the first one where 80% of the budget wasn't film and processing. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. So you get a lot more of that forty-five grand up on the screen now. <laughs> By the way, Yvonne Naj, who was Heidi Fleiss's partner, financed Hitchhiker Massacre. That's why Ron Jeremy, we were talking about earlier, was at the cast and crew screening. And at the, uh, the party, he loved my out-call, in-call idea. It's too bad he died of cancer. Oh. Yeah. Ron Jeremy's dead? No, no, no. no. Von Naj. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. No, Ron will never die. Yeah. The, the hedgehog will live forever. Oh, yeah. my gosh. So funny. But it is a different industry now because you can shoot a film in seven days and you can well, with the uh, digital listen, revolution. I, I did four films for Fred and Ray. They were on film and they were shot in six days. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that wasn't the norm back then. Now it's No, the no, norm. no. But it was oh, a norm for Fred. <laughs> <laughs> That Roger Corman and all that. I mean, yes, that was that, that, I think that Roger Corman film I did with Jimmy was uh, probably 10, 11 days, was, yeah. maybe 12 days was his shooting schedule. Yeah, the whole grindhouse idea, just get it out, hey, get, you it know. out get it out. Hey, uh, in fact, when I went up for that job, I was at uh, high school, it was supposed to be high school, and I was like in my 20s, and I was working in a toner room selling toner on the phone, and I fucking hated it, and I was no good at it. I didn't sell one gram of toner, but they gave me a little quick course in sales I went in for the audition and Chuck Griffith who wrote The Little Shop of Horrors says to me after the audition well you're a good actor but I think you're a little old for the part and this little voice in my head said turn the objection into a question answer the question and ask another question (laughs) and I said but Chuck you want somebody you can act don't you of course you do do you really want to go five to one on this and I walked out (laughs) with the job subject to Roger's approval (laughs) (laughs) now you grew up obviously around some legends who as a child and you can as a teen and as an adult who were you most impressed with as a child and why okay no one Okay. Except that <laughs> for their I, talent. I only went out of my way to meet two actors in my life. Uh, one of them, I saw him across a room, and I went and grabbed him. And uh, that was Peter Sellers. And the other one was when I was living with David Carradine. I, he, we met at the bottom of the stairs. He said, Sterling Hayden called me. He wants me to meet him at Alice's Restaurant in Malibu. Do you want to go? And I went, General Jack fucking Ripper, you're goddamn right I want to go. Because <laughs> Dr. Strangelove changed my life. I was nine years old during the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
uh, and a film came out called Failsafe with uh, Henry Fonda, and uh, le- and uh, it terrified the living shit out of me. I was having nightmares of flaming mushroom clouds. And the next year, when I was ten, at a matinee in Beverly Hills, I saw Doctor Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, and I never thought about it again. <laughs> so th- those were the only two actors I ever went out of my way to meet, and that was the reason. Wow, amazing! Do you want to ask him a question about? Uh when I met Laurence Olivier, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. I was in my 20s. The real family name is Blythe. My great-grandfather stole the name Barrymore. We're not sure from where exactly, but it is the name of the butler in The Hound of the Baskervilles by A. Conan yes, Doyle. Yes. Um, but uh, I was introduced as John Barrymore III, and Olivier said, Nice to meet you, Mr. Blythe. <laughs> Just to let me know that he knew what the fuck was up with my family history. Right. Yeah, it was really weird because when I was reading, researching you, I did see where the original Barry Moores, and I'll just call them, you know, from the silent, that they had actually gotten their names even on theater from other people, some of them. Uh, well, the, the Barrymore name the came Barrymore. from. But then, then my great grandfather, who was the first actor in his family, and who, by the way, was. As Ethel said, they were indignant in the way that only an Anglo-Indian family could have been. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, his what mother Lionel was uh, his mother was Indian. My great grandfather. Anyway, uh, uh, he married into an old American acting family, the Drew family. My great great grandmother, Louisa Lane Drew, founded the Art Street Theater in Philadelphia and entertained Abraham Lincoln in the White House as a teenager. Wow. Uh, so yeah, it goes back a long way, but. But yeah. they put the name together, so if somebody he was changed the name from to from Herbert Blythe to Morris Barrymore, spelled Maurice, but English pronunciation, <laughs> to spare his family the disgrace of having an actor in the family, because the Blythes were squires, which that's that's the basement of the peerage, but it's still a hell of a lot better than being a commoner, and so my, uh, <laughs> you know. What can you, what can I say? I'm calling them the Blythes from now on. Yeah. yeah. Did you know. ever uh, did you ever find out from stories within the family why say we'll just pick Lionel and Ethel why they decided to pursue a career in acting? Was yes, that wasn't uh, the because their grandmother thing? owned the theater. Ah. Uh, my grandfather and his brother. I don't know about Ethel. Gr- my grandfather and his brother both wanted to be artists and weren't good enough, and so. Um, they fell back into the family business, and my grandfather talked about his incredible badness when he was starting out, and he only got to get good because his mo- grandmother owned the theater. Mm. So it really was. I mean, it, we always joke about the family business of the Baldwin family. That's the, how I got into I mean, it. I mean, I was a 19-year-old with high school dropout with no other marketable skills that I knew of. And but you said it was for the money. That's why when you were younger, that's why you wouldn't do it. I said, well, maybe I should try acting. That's what my family's always But done. I heard <laughs> that you that your mother didn't want you to go into acting and you right. signed a contract when you were like 16 or 19 No. Or so, well, or? I didn't. Well, I mean, uh, the only contracts I ever signed were for individual jobs, but I started acting when I was 19. Uh, you know, I, I, but didn't your mom try to send you away to school? Or she, 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 she definitely didn't want me to be an actor. But you know what, Drew, Drew. I recently did an interview for a documentary they did about Drew, and the documentarian said to me, "Well, Drew doesn't want her daughters to be actors." And I said, "Really? Then why'd she name both of them after roles she's played?" <laughs> <laughs> now, did you ever get to meet your grandfather? No, he died in 1942. But I did get to have some contact with him when my father and I stole his body. Oh. <laughs> uh, there's a story. Yeah. Uh, all I can say is that I was looking at IMDb. It says other people buried at, at Calvary Cemetery. It says John Barrymore hybrid. That's one of my movies. They've got me and granddad's empty crypt. Oh, man. You know that expression? It felt like somebody walked over my grave. I know exactly what they mean now. I take it the statute of limitations is over so you can talk about all that. Now. Well, yeah. I, who cares? I so, mean, what, so what happened? You said that you you went into the technology industry for a yes, while. What I caused was, you to, to Well, first of all, well, I was always had a head for it. I uh, I was one of only two kids at Beverly High allowed to run the three hundred thousand dollars Ice Planetarium. The other was ten as a sophomore in high school. <laughs> I think he graduated college when he was sixteen. Wow. Um, and uh, it was the persistence of one friend. I was a m- abominably bad waiter. I never got any good at it. I did it for decades. I worked in places where everybody went home with a lot of money except me. When I got promoted from busboy to waiter, I proved the Peter principle. And uh, 
I got okay at the people part of it, but I never got any good at the time management getting you your dinner part of it. <laughs> and a friend who had been bugging me to get into computers since high school finally just gave me one uh, in 1988, and six months later I was making my living off computers. So was it just like acting was like, it, you, it wasn't a passion at the time, or it wasn't Well, I mean, I did, get, I did get serious about it after the first year or two. Um, but, you know, I, I, I ran an actor's workshop. I coach. When it comes to advice... I've got some advice for people getting into Good. this industry. So what, oh, wow. you, you don't work. I just, one of my pet peeves is people who come here and they do the same old job, the waiter, the bartender. Da, da. So one of the things I try to do is to get people to, to tell us what kind of jobs, other than the typical jobs, one can do while pursuing an, actor, an acting career well, uh, to supplement their income. My, That's not a waiter, a waitress, or bartender. My two careers overlapped. Uh, at the same time, I was lo- making money looping Hercules and Xena, making good, steady money as an actor for the first time. Mm. I was doing this computer thing, and I was working at Paramount in the computer department. And I would go into these casting offices, and they didn't remember me. But the same people who had treated me as an annoyance when I was there 15 <laughs> years earlier as an actor shut down their office, took the phones off the hook, and gave me their full attention when I was there to solve their software problem. Mm. So uh, I got a call from... Uh, Sunnyvale to work in the missile division at Lockheed Martin and I said well if you're an actor you're in Hollywood if you're a programmer I guess Silicon Valley and and I moved up there and I was out of town for 12 years although I visited a lot and did a great job for Warner Brothers in the middle of that best job I ever had Mm. uh and so uh you know why the defense contracting business is like the movie business no Why? You ran, if you ran any other business that way, you would be out of business. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Okay, so what, <laughs> what do you feel are the three characteristic traits needed to be a great actor? All right. Uh, number one and most important above all is rhino skin. Forget thick skin. You have to have rhino skin. If you, if you are going to uh, let assholes in suits uh, be responsible for your self-esteem, just go, go home now, okay, <laughs> yeah. and, and save yeah. yourself the heartache. Yeah. Um, I always told people who came to an workshop, The Big Picture, starring Kevin Bacon, Blake Edwards' film S.O.B., mm-hmm. and Robert Altman's film The Player, and you'll know everything you need to know about how Hollywood really works. What, about, so what true. about Swimming with Sharks? You know what? Everybody says I should swimming see that added sharks. to the list. Oh, I haven't seen it. it. No. Oh, you would be obsessed over that. <laughs> oh, that's it. That's all you need. Now, what are, what, are, what are some things you would tell if someone said, John, I live in Kansas and I want to move to Hollywood to be an actor. What is the advice, one piece, you would give them? Don't. <laughs> There's a, you know, the thing is that um, celebrity. Now, my, my parents were working actors, but they weren't mobbed everywhere they went. But I lived with David Carradine when he was the biggest star on television and had uh-huh. just given an interview to Rolling Stone stating that he had a, a listed phone number. So as soon as you put the phone down, it rang. As soon as it's it like... Bleh. Uh, so I got a really up close personal look at what that kind of celebrity is like it's much better and believe me I know something about this it's much better to be rich and not famous Mm. than it is to be famous and not rich Mm. celebrity is something you tolerate in order to have money and power Mm. Uh, there are much better ways to get rich and much better ways to get rich in show business and just to illustrate I was up for a movie called uh, Real Genius early in my career. Love that movie. And uh, about, uh, about 15 minutes into the interview, Kathleen Summers, Marty Ransoff's associate producer, said, I have a better idea. Why don't you drop this acting thing? Come work for me here in production. I should have said yes, okay? No. She's already retired rich uh, in Malibu <laughs> with every other actress I ever dated who said, fuck this, yes, I'm going into production. Yeah, yeah that's right. So let's say that, that, that person in Kansas doesn't listen to you. And okay. They come out, they come out here anyway. They get right. off the bus. What would be the next advice you give to them? Uh, well, uh, Rhino Skin is number one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the second is see those three films because they really do illustrate how Hollywood sharks. really works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yes, it's very much about who you know. Okay? No, no shit. <laughs> and um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, my, my, uh, I've never invested my uh, self-esteem you know what? The biggest leap I ever made forward in, in psychological, emotional, and uh, 
um, uh, uh, spiritual freedom was the day I stopped giving a fuck what other people say, write, or think about me. Mm-hmm. That's that's the like there should be a pamphlet they hand them when they get off the bus with those big yeah. doe eyes and just yeah. Said, the reason Scientology no. is the only religion, air quotes intentional, <laughs> with uh, a celebrity center is not just because they use their celebrities to promote their religion. Mm-hmm. It's because celebrity is a thing that most normal people think they might like to have. People who have absolutely no experience with it and have never seen it up close. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's what yeah. what you still have a whole bunch of life left, honey. What would be a dream role? Like your yes, whole I'd like life. To, I would like to point out that although I'm sixty three years old, I'm not a has been, I'm a ne'er do well. I still have a, my, my salad days are still ahead of me. That's the spirit. Plenty of untapped potential. What would I. Dream role. I just played Hamlet five years ago. You did? Even Was though I swore a- I would never play that part, I did, uh, I did a lampoon of Hamlet in my 30s. Biggest crowd pleaser I was ever in. Mm. Hamlet's last act at the Variety Arts Club. But I did do Hamlet five years ago. And uh, even though they're about to do a BBC one with um, Sir Anthony Hopkins, uh, I want to do Lear, uh, at least direct it. And I, uh, at this point, I might as well go ahead and play the fucking part, too, because, you know, <laughs> I can see you do my hair is all white. <laughs> yeah. Do what do you find? Um, what do you find being the hardest? What is the hardest part about you once people find out you're a Barry Marr? Do, do they, like, act strange you know, around you? People always or say... Or do they ask you questions, personal being questions? Being John Barrymore, was that a hindrance or a help? And yeah. I always say yes. Ah. <laughs> it's a two-edged sword. It cuts deeply in both directions, and I wouldn't trade it. I mean, uh, it's got, for one thing, it, it, it's gotten me to a million parties that I wasn't on the <laughs> right. list for. And a lot of chicks. <laughs> enough, yeah. A lot you know of what? chicks, right? Uh, the one thing that being John Barrymore was good for was I had many opportunities to marry hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. <laughs> Unfortunately, that the horse has left the barn, the barn's burnt down. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, you know. Or you still have your salad days. It's just that, I still have my salad days. Head, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> now, I want to talk about, you want to talk about a success story. This is for people who feel down and out. And, and I want you to listen to this because John Blythe Barrymore the third. I love saying that. Okay. <laughs> he is such a success story. Now, he's a humble man, so I hope that he doesn't mind me asking this question. But it's very important for you if you are really feeling bad and down and out and just like you really aren't going to make it this is a success story in 2000 now obviously you're descended from hollywood entertainment industry royalty but in 2012 i read on wikipedia that you found yourself homeless and on skid row okay. and you wrote her a never, shirt all right and said i'm drew barrymore's okay. brother is first that of all true? i was never on skid row why okay. did they put that stuff and on wait there a well, wikipedia I was, is absolutely true no 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 uh i was I was technically homeless in that I didn't have a mortgage or a lease, <laughs> but I never, sp- I didn't spend a night on the street. I mean, I've been, I was couch surfing for years, and I've never spent a night they on the had street. Had you being a real artist? <laughs> that was, uh, that was a the first story uh, that I was homeless. I was at Occupy LA, and I was there to see it. I had a place to live, but I, I was there yeah. on purpose. Yeah, and uh, the original uh, Inquirer article didn't tell any untruths. It said I was homeless, which technically was true. Right. Yeah. And it called me a belligerent bum, which is a value <laughs> judgment, okay? But other than that, they'd... Then the Chicago Sun Times, the supposedly legitimate paper, said I was living in a refrigerator box on Skid Row, <laughs> and I didn't even know where Skid Row was. I had to ask the people at Occupy LA. I said, "Where's Skid Row?" As, <laughs> as someone who used to work for the Chicago Tribune, fuck the Sun yes, Times. Yes, so yeah. right there, I'm yeah, with you. Exactly. They didn't. Uh, they didn't uh, ask you at all. They didn't like Clarence uh, Page. You can do better. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so so we don't have a we don't have a rags but, to riches uh, what, story. What was the last you? thing you? Asked about it was um, a, it said that you oh were yeah the shirt the that t-shirt you wore a okay. shirt walking right. up and down in 2011 <laughs> in 2011 everybody said to me what do you want for your birthday and I said I want a t-shirt that says Drew Barrymore's brother on the front okay <laughs> because listen Keith Carradine back in the day had a shirt that said brother of John on one side and son of David on the, uh, no brother of David on one side and son of John on the other. And you have to have a sense of humor about these yeah. things. I mean, I've gone to make dope deals, and, and the, uh, you know, who's there? John Barrymore. 
Drew Barrymore's brother? <laughs> <laughs> so, Come in! Okay. The kids uh, of the weed, dude. So, I mean, people are going to call me. That's why, you know, you have to have a sense of humor about it. So somebody actually got me a shirt that said Drew Barrymore's brother on the front and John Barrymore the third on the back. Mm. And, uh, you know. Now it was you a, see that, people? Don't look in the weed. Fake news! Fake news! <laughs> oh, no. We're getting the real you know what? story! Celebrity journalism has always been an oxymoron. Mm. Yeah. Unfortunately... Legitimate journalism was going the same way. Donald Trump, though, is, is reviving. He, first of all, he's uniting the country against Donald Trump. And second of all, he's reviving journalism. <laughs> okay, so um, I will move on from that. But <laughs> anyway, we, we I'm, I'm, don't do I'm, yeah, politics yeah. there. Uh, do Dan Krause, do what? you have any cr- questions for the lovely John Blythe Barrymore, being an actor of theater yourself? Did you ever pitch an idea to the Corman? No. No, he loves but, Roger but but Roger Corman recently posted on Facebook, "Should I make a steampunk movie?" And I said, "Roger, you already did Frankenstein. Remember his <laughs> oh, Frankenstein right. was Frankenstein, totally Frankenstein, steampunk." Frankenstein, 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 yeah. or something. Yeah. Though, but right. when I met Roger Corman, my mind was blown. I mean, I expected like a Sam Arkoff, a guy with a cigar, and not yeah. this erudite, soft-spoken, professorial. Oh yeah, engineer. <laughs> Have you and Roger ever done anything wild and exciting together? I mean, other Does than... Roger ever do anything wild and exciting? He did LSD. <laughs> that's wild. <laughs> I'm sure that's what he wants on his tombstone. <laughs> you know, Tim Leary was a friend of mine, and Tim Leary was a sweet, gentle man who would not willingly hurt a fly. But he fucked it up for two generations. They couldn't even do research. Okay, and now they're finally doing research again. Mm, so let's yeah. go. I'd, I'd like to go back to... so. What's next? So you've got... Okay, directing. first of all, believe me, it pisses me the fuck off that I have to come up with a fifth act. Okay? <laughs> fifth? I think at this point you're like eight, nine, I ten. I know, we you normally know. have This is Angels act. in America Chapter part two. You know? Yes, I, I, I keep wondering if I've got a fifth act in me, but you know, what the hell. <laughs> but you had mentioned directing and you had mentioned... I, I, like, I have, I've directed a lot of plays and they were easy. By the way, I've never been a... Pre- actually, that's not true. I produced one play and I said, if I ever want to do this again, just fucking slap me, okay? I was, I used to think the producer was the person who did the least work and made the most money. That's the executive producer. You have to get your title straight, okay? The actual producer works his ass off. I've never been good at the organizational thing. My thing is get me there and I'll perform. I directed a bunch of plays. They were all huge crowd pleasers. They couldn't make money. They were in black box theaters. Mm. But they were easy to do because I know how to talk to actors. Both of my parents were actors. Yes. Right. Okay? Yes. And so, uh, you know, I'd li- like to direct some more. And um, I am writing now. Uh, I, well, first of all, writing is the one thing that uh, I've had a lot of success with. Everything I've written has been published m- multiple times. It, but it's all been short form, either poetry or short autobiographical things. And I was at a, a microtonal music thing down at the Hyperion oh. Tavern. And you've got to have a propeller on your head to even be something like this. Okay? <laughs> yeah. And John Schneider from KCRW was down there performing with his daughter, Erin. And afterwards, we're outside smoking. And Erin says, what's your name? And I said, John Barrymore. She said, John Barrymore? There's a poet named John Barrymore. <laughs> That's what she said? I wanted to kiss her right in front of her girlfriend, okay? Because that's not my sister, my uncle, my brother, my right. second cousin. That's me. So... Um, People have been bugging me to write a book for decades because they know I've lived a storied life and they like my writing. Yeah. So uh, I've embarked on that. I have some of it written. I need a secretary and a taskmaster. Uh, I need yeah. a book deal, not for a ghostwriter. I need a secretary and a taskmaster because left to my own devices, well, I have a card that says Sloth LLC. <laughs> we put the pro in procrastinate. Mm. You need yeah. a deadline, sir. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, it, so is it... So, so <laughs> Film? Have you ever directed film? Is that something I've directed that would be a couple? I've directed some uh, digital shorts. In fact, if you go to my YouTube channel, there's a a um, uh, some outtakes of me directing a digital short. And oh, by I'd the way, if you go to my YouTube channel, click on Lasagna Cat because I'm at eight hundred and thirty thousand views. That's what I was telling I'm trying telling to push Eric it over about. a million. I was telling it. That's the show I was telling I you was about. Reading about it. You yeah. went on some show, and for the whole hour, you talked. It's a one-hour monologue a about philosophical about a three-panel Garfield, Garfield cartoon. Field. Okay. How the hell did you stretch that out? It, no, it was, that's how it was written. Oh. Jim Davis. That did is, it for by the way, years. that's a one hour. <laughs> that is a one hour cold reading. Okay, I'm reading that off a teleprompter, and 
they, after I finished the first take, they fucking applauded. They thought it would be there all night. I heard it was they did like twenty yet minutes, inspiring. 20 minutes of uh, pickups that added less than a minute of film. They didn't even use them. They used the raw first take. Wow. See, is it on YouTube? Can we watch it's, it? Yes. If my, by the way, the way to find me is Navefool. That's K-N-A-V-E-F-O-O-L. Yes, on Twitter. And that's on Twitter. Twitter at Navefool. And then, uh, it's everything. And just oh. If you put Navefool into Google, I'm the first thing that comes okay. up. Okay. Even on, on your and, channel, and your YouTube, YouTube channel. And it's YouTube, Twitter, okay. Instagram, uh, you know, the uh, publisher's clearinghouse, everything. What are your yeah. thoughts on social media? Like, it, how do you, how do you interact? You know, do you I like can't it? imagine John I got trying to... <laughs> listen, I got into computers at 35, and they were very, very good to me. I mean, I made a ton of money when I was running software. I was raising three kids in Silicon Valley in Monterey. I spent a ton of money, too. But um, I, I, social media is great, except for face fuck. Mm. <laughs> well, you definitely have to promote yourself via social media. Um, this is the world of social media, so we have to do it, but we got to find a secretary for yes. John. And I, I'm, I specialize in anti social media. <laughs> anti social you know. media. We can find you a pretty woman with a whip. I think we could. Uh, uh, yes. You know what? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're very, they're I see one of those every Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> John's dance cards are full yeah. of women with yeah, whips. But you know what? Now that it's become mainstream, I have to find find something else oh, that's true yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. he has a whole movie going on at home with woman number one yeah. with woman number one. okay last question what do you when you leave this earth to go on to wherever what do you want your legacy to be i don't give a flying rat's <laughs> ass I, I i've never felt pressured that i had to make my <laughs> mark on the world believe me i've made my mark on the world i mean uh you know i mean John I, I, I don't even i can't even, i don't even know all the people i know that yeah. I made a big impression on, but I hear about them all the time. Mm. Right. Uh, you know, and... Uh, uh, well, I'm still wondering how the heck you were on, in Kung Fu at four months and then you were hanging out with no, John no, no. Karaki. No, no, I was, I was on... Uh, I was on... Uh, I was playing Baby Moses at oh, four Oh, Baby months. Moses. I was 20... I was 19 when I did Kung Fu. Oh, so you and John They had hired Karen. an actor and they fired him the first day and oh. they needed somebody over 18 who could play 15 and I'd been to the set and David and I was living with him said, what about John Barrymore? See who you yeah. know. Right there. Exactly. You know. Right there. Exactly. Uh-huh. Who and the know? producer said, get him over here. Yep. Okay. Right. So what is the most annoying fucking question you ever get? <laughs> uh, hey, you know what the best thing about being Drew Barrymore's brother is? <laughs> There's really nothing. Oh, <laughs> ooh, you heard that. All right. Well, with that, we are going to exit. All exits. All exits. Uh, we want to thank John Blythe Barrymore the Third for being on the show. Thank you. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for my fake applause. My fake applause. And I want to thank Eric Erickson, oh, the hottie you. new film. True. He actually is a hottie. New true. Girl. He is a. He is. A I mean, I'm, you are interested in girls. Right? Oh yes. Okay. Oh, John's going to come next time in his outfit. It <laughs> is Whip Woman number two outfit. And thank you, Dan Kraus, for being on the show thank today. You for me. Thank Mr. You. Actor about to do Ghost Walk, I'm sure. And the lovely Albert Biko, who is always filming. my my <laughs> filming. Yes, filming. And John, can I get a lock and commit that you'll come back on the show next year? Absolutely. It'll be so much fun. We'll bring the band back. <laughs> It'll be the same people oh, will come back. Yeah, but wait, Jasmine, I, I, I also have a Christian drama drama coming out uh, that I did and I said this isn't for Hallmark is it they said no and I said good because I was afraid I was going to be bookended you know like Mark Twain (laughs) with Haley's Comet you you can reprise your role as baby Moses yes (laughs) Moses as an adult okay everybody thank you so much for tuning in if you have any questions please check out John Blake Barrymore on Twitter at the name fool go and subscribe to his uh, YouTube channel and go to theangryviking.com for the hottie Erica Eric said, thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye, everybody. Irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio.